Uh, thank you for that warm smattering of applause. I appreciate that. <laughs> welcome, welcome, everybody. Happy Texas Independence Day. This is the panel on civil rights law, the final panel of the 2013 National Student Symposium. No doubt the feistiest panel of the symposium. Um, trust me, there is no Jedi mind meld or Vulcan mind meld or Romulan or Klingon or any other type on the panel. Um, and really, I think our very setting today, the LBJ Auditorium at the LBJ School, next to the LBJ Library, not far from Lake LBJ, um, I really can't think of a more fitting location for the discussion. You know, Texas and this campus specifically has really been uh, the epicenter for multiple titanic um, civil rights battles at the U.S. Supreme Court, including this very term. Um, way back in 1950, four years before Brown v. Board of Education, the Supreme Court decided the landmark case of Sweat v. Painter, we all know about that, integrating UT Law School. And Thurgood Marshall um, helped to litigate that case just a few blocks down the street at the Travis County Courthouse, and in fact, a few years ago, the Travis County Courthouse was renamed in honor of the plaintiff, Mr. Sweat. And when the lawsuit was first filed, the state of Texas very quickly established a separate law school for black law students, and it now bears the name of Thurgood Marshall, Thurgood Marshall School of Law. Um, another interesting factoid, just as Marshall's opposing counsel in Sweat was a guy named Joe Greenhill, who would later become dear friends with Justice Marshall and also became Chief Justice of my court, the Supreme Court of Texas. And in fact, on the day that Brown v. Board of Education was decided, Chief Justice Greenhill and his family happened to be visiting the Supreme Court that day. And when the word came down in Brown, um, this elated Thurgood Marshall uh, scooped up Chief Justice Greenhill's son, also named Joe, and put him on his shoulders and then paraded him around the marbled halls of the court. Um, and 50 years later, that little boy's son, also named Joe, Joe Five, we call him, is now a law clerk for one of my colleagues at the Supreme Court. Um, more recently, just 143 days ago, the court heard arguments in Fisher, the University of Texas, I believe Fisher, I think I'm right, I think Fisher is the one and only case yet to be decided from the batch that was argued last October when the term began. And I think um, a couple of today's panelists were amici in that case, which will be decided not by all nine members of the court, but only eight, Justice Kagan is recused. And just this week, uh, one of President Johnson's signature achievements, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, um, was before the court again, as they, again, were kind of weighing the constitutionality of Section 5. Um, it's an epic case for obvious reasons, and, and certainly for Texas. We're one of nine states subject to border to border um, to the VRA. So Texas is frequently on the minds of the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department which has opposed um, Texas efforts to pass voter ID, efforts to redistrict um, state and federal legislative boundaries. So given all that history from nearly 60 years ago to this very week, um, there's really no more fitting venue than here for this really timely, really spirited discussion um, on the e efficacy, on the constitutionality of affirmative action and our various anti-discrimination laws. Um, we've got a pretty high voltage panel today um, batting leadoff is the shy and retiring Lino Gralia, the A.W. Walker Centennial Chair in Law. Professor Gralia joined the UT faculty the year I was born. And I remember well the commotion that shook the hospital nursery when we learned of his hiring. There were cries of joy. That retiring is not literal. <laughs> um, a graduate of City College of New York and Columbia Law School, Professor Gralia is one of America's most notable conservative legal academics. He's written widely in constitutional law, especially on judicial review, constitutional interpretation, race discrimination, and antitrust, and he's written extensively about the Fisher case now pending um, at the U.S. Supreme Court. Um, second, uh, Shep Melnick teaches a variety of courses on American politics at Boston College, where he holds a chair named after 
former U.S. House Speaker Tip O'Neill, who I think would have turned 100 last December. Incredible. Um, and like the legendary Speaker O'Neill, Professor Melnick was once upon a time a lawmaker, a member of the New Hampshire legislature. Uh, the only, I think the only non-lawyer on the panel today, uh, Professor Melnick is a three-time Harvard grad, really could have spoken on um, any of the panels today. He's a versatile public policy scholar whose academic work focuses on the intersection of law and politics and the role that courts play in American um, politics and policy making. Um, he co-chairs the Harvard program on constitutional government, previously taught at Harvard and at Brandeis where he chaired the um, politics department. My wife says if we ever have another son, um, she insists that we name it Shep. She's very fond of that name, so <laughs> stay tuned. Uh, Stuart Taylor is an author and Pulitzer-nominated freelance journalist focusing on legal and policy issues. Most recently, he co-authored the book Mismatch, How Affirmative Action Hurts Students, It's Intended to Help, and Why Universities Won't Admit It. Judge Posner praised Mismatch as, quote, the best researched and most convincing analysis ever done on affirmative action in higher education. And as I mentioned, Mr. Taylor filed an amicus brief in the Fisher case awaiting decision at the court. Graduate of Princeton and Harvard Law School, he's covered the U.S. Supreme Court in legal matters generally for National Journal, the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, the American Lawyer, Legal Times, New Republic, Slate, and basically everyone except The Onion, I think. Because um, <laughs> journalism has won honors and accolades galore. Um, finally, not finally, got any cleanup, I guess. Professor Gail Harriet teaches at the University of San Diego School of Law, and for the last six years, she's been a member of the U.S. Commission on Civil Rights, graduate of Northwestern University and Chicago Law School. Uh, she co-chaired, once upon a time, the campaign to pass Prop 209, the California Civil Rights Initiative, and also practiced law alongside a young whippersnapper named John Roberts at Hogan and Hartson. Um, at the University of San Diego, she teaches virtually everything, including employment discrimination and civil rights law and history, and her list of publications and speeches and testimony, especially in the area of racial preferences and affirmative action, is, is really not a mile long, it's really a marathon long, and I don't think I know of anybody who's written more extensively or more recently in this area than Professor Harriet. And finally, the caboose today, uh, UT's own Professor Sanford Levinson holds the, holds the esteemed Garwood Chair at UT Law School, named after a father-son duo who both served on my court, the Supreme Court of Texas. Uh, Professor Levinson has more degrees than a thermometer, including a, <laughs> a PhD from Harvard and a law degree from Stanford. Um, he also teaches government here at UT, as he did at Princeton, and he recently received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Political Science Association. Um, he's a member of the prestigious American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's written several hundred, several hundred scholarly pieces, including several books. Most recently, our undemocratic constitution, where the constitution goes wrong, and how we the people can correct it which calls for a second constitutional convention and a top to bottom revision of our nation's founding document. Um, but I have to say, I think my three children are more likely to favor the work of Professor Levinson's wife, who's an award-winning writer of children's literature. Um, with that, I'm gonna ask Professor Gralia to step up to the plate. The panelists, we just have about 20 minutes, which will leave about 20 minutes at the end for questions from you. Um, if they exceed their 20 minutes, um, the red light will come on and the trap door will open. After the trap door, we couldn't afford the sequester. Uh, we had to cut the trap door, but we'll do the best we can. Thank you, Judge, and thank you for being here. Before 1964, the last piece of major federal civil rights legislation was the Civil Rights Act of 1875, prohibiting race discrimination in public accommodations, which the Supreme Court unfortunately held unconstitutional. Thereafter, the combination of the Senate filibuster and Southern Democratic control of the Senate Judiciary Committee 
made the enactment of further civil rights legislation seem impossible. But the assassination of President Kennedy, the replacement by President Johnson, the arrests of Dr. And, and, and marches of Dr. Martin Luther King, and Alabama Sheriff Bull Connor's police dogs and fire hoses against civil rights marches, all displayed nightly on national television, made a federal response finally irresistible. And the result was the enactment of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, our greatest piece of civil rights legislation. The purpose of the act was quite simply to ratify, effectuate, and extend what Congress and everyone else understood to be the principle of Brown a prohibition of all official race discrimination. The history of the act, however, is a literally incredible history of judicial and administrative abuse of power, perhaps unequaled in the history of law, certainly American law, whereby the major provisions of the act were reversed in meaning, so that instead of prohibiting, they were made to require or permit race discrimination. The act has four major sections. Title II prohibits race discrimination by restaurants, hotels, and other public accommodations. Title IV deals with public grade school education. Title VI prohibits discrimination by institutions that receive federal funds. And Title VII prohibits discrimination in employment. Title II is of little current interest because it is not in the interest of businesses to turn away black customers, and they were glad to be prohibited from doing so. Each of the other three titles, however, soon came to be seen by civil rights professionals not as victories, but as obstacles to racial advance. As the movement to prohibit race discrimination began with the schools, so did the movement to make racial discrimination a constitutional requirement for the first time. School racial segregation came to a quick and complete end as a result of the 64 Act, but school racial separation did not. Non-racial neighborhood assignment in areas of residential racial concentration resulted in racially concentrated schools. Civil rights leaders saw this as a problem, and the remedy was obvious compulsory integration, a return to racial assignment, only now not to separate the races, but to increase integration. Brown's prohibition of race discrimination thus quickly went from being a great achievement to being an obstacle to be overcome. In 1968, 1968 Green case, a unanimous Supreme Court led by Justice Brennan decided to make the move from prohibiting segregation to requiring integration. Extraordinarily ambitious, extraordinarily uh, unwise. After 14 years of litigation, the Southern School Districts were finally brought into compliance with Brown, only to be told that was no longer the constitutional requirement if insufficient integration resulted. An openly admitted requirement of integration was not possible, however. It would have required the court to at least qualify, if not overrule Brown, and would have been applicable to the whole country, not just the South. And would have required the court to explain what compulsory integration was expected to accomplish, none of which the court wanted to do. Justice Brennan cleverly avoided those unwanted consequences by simply denying that the requirement was integration, and insisting it was only something quite different, desegregation. So instead of contradicting Brown, the court was actually, we're told, enforcing Brown, imposing a requirement of racial discrimination in the name of, imposing a, of enforcing a prohibition. And the, uh, uh, it, it, the, uh, the uh, integration would now be required only in the South. So it wasn't integration, it was desegregation, <clears throat> which no doubt, in the opinion of the country, deserved whatever the court was proposing to do to it. 
The downside of the desegregation rationale for compulsory integration, however, was that it is both false, because the cause of school racial separation is the same in the South as in the North, residential patterns, and invalid. Because if compulsory integration is good policy in the South, why is it not good policy in the North? As Brennan once candidly explained, however, on the green issue, honesty, he said, is, quote, simply impractical, unquote. Well, honesty is practical, he used the other way. Changing the constitutional requirement from prohibiting segregation to requiring integration was exactly what Congress feared and meant to preclude in enacting Title IV, which could not be more clear. It defines desegregation as the assignment of children to public schools without regard to their race and repeats in an excess of portion redundantly, it shall, it quote, shall not mean assignment to overcome racial imbalance, unquote. The court explained, however, that Congress meant that to apply only to the schools of the North. When I was a participant in the busing wars, arguing in court and elsewhere against busing for compulsory integration, someone would invariably later inform me that he had found the answer to the problem. Busing was prohibited by the 1964 Civil Rights Act. I would have to disappoint them by saying I already knew that. <laughs> but how then, they would ask incredulously, can the judges order it? Because, I would say, American judges are not subject to law. They make the law. <laughs> And uh, when other government officials abuse their power, you go to the judges. But when it is the judges, there's no way to go. But how then, they would ask, can we stop this insane busing? We can't, I said. I only argue losing causes. <laughs> <laughs> if you have any doubt about any of this and the power of judges, the power of federal judges, consider that a mere district judge in Kansas City could order the state of Missouri to spend $2 billion, billion, to attempt to lure white students back to Kansas City schools. The orders were totally futile and senseless, the aid education, the aid uh, integration, they did nothing, but they were nonetheless obeyed. How high would the cost have to go, I wonder? $10 billion, $100 billion? before the judge would encounter resistance. Is there any point? If the Supreme Court could do what it did to Title IV, it obviously could do the same to the other titles, and it did. In Griggs v. Duke Power in 1971, a unanimous court, in an opinion by Chief Justice Berger, converted Title VII's requirement that employers make employment decisions without regard to race into a requirement that they make no employment decisions without regard to race. When Congress prohibited employers from racially discriminating, Berger explained, it meant also to prohibit them from preferring high school graduates to high school dropouts, and persons without a criminal record to persons with a criminal record, when the result, as usual, is to disproportionately disqualify blacks, unless the employer undertakes to show that it is a business necessity. Berger neglected to cite the congressional record to support this statement, which, of course, is entirely false. The congressional record could not be clearer that Congress explicitly meant to preclude that result. This was not a mistake by Berger and the justices who joined the unanimous opinion. It was a deliberate falsehood. In United Steelworkers of America v. Weber, the court, in the opinion by Justice Brennan, made it explicit that a white is not a, quote, person within the meaning of Title VII. Finally, in the 1978 Bakke case, the court did it to Title VI. What it did in Green to Title IV and in Griggs to Title VII. Title VI, as I said, prohibits race discrimination by any institution that receives federal funds. The University of California Davis Medical School received federal funds and was racially discriminated. There could be no doubt, therefore, of the violation. But only four justices were willing to decide the case in good faith. The statutory violation being clear, 
they correctly pointed out in the opinion by Justice Stevens, there was no need to consider any constitutional question. Four other justices, however, led by Justice Brennan, found Title VI's the prohibition of race discrimination to be cryptic. And the ninth justice, Powell, found it to be majestic. But either way, it didn't mean what it said, according to them. Following the theory that a patent falsehood gains credibility by being stated with assurance, Powell found it useful to assert not merely that this was the legislative intent, but it was, quote, the clear legislative intent, unquote. Well, four justices are pointing out that that was absolutely ridiculous. Turning to the constitutional question, Brennan, the Brennan Four took the position that discrimination in favor of blacks should not be subject to strict scrutiny and was therefore permissible as a remedy for societal discrimination. Justice Powell took the opposite position that all race discrimination is subject to strict scrutiny and that societal discrimination is too vague a concept to be a compelling interest. Harvard, however, he naively believed, had found the answer. Race discrimination is permissible in higher education to achieve a racially diverse student body. After all, Harvard argued, if it can prefer a student from Montana to just another student from New York, why can't it prefer a black to a white? Harvard had never heard of the 14th Amendment. <laughs> <laughs> Justice you know, William Buckley's most famous statement, I think perhaps, is that he'd rather be ruled by the first 2,000 names in the Boston phone book than by the Harvard faculty. <laughs> well, we are ruled by the Harvard faculty. This is the clearest example. Justice O'Connor's opinion for the court in Gruda in 2003 raised Powell's one-man idiosyncrasy to the status of majority opinion. And that's how diversity got to be a compelling interest, even though no one believes it. None of the arguments for affirmative action prior to Bakke said anything about diversity. Such egregious abuses of power by elected officials <coughs> would result in censure and sanction. But for the Supreme Court justices, there is none. Impeachment, which Hamilton saw as a, quote, complete assurance, unquote, against judicial behavior, turned out to be, as Jefferson said, not even a scarecrow. The justices' actions exemplify Lord Acton's dictum about the corrupting effects of uncontrolled power. As government officials least subject to popular or political control, and all being lawyers, it is hardly surprising that they have the lowest standards of integrity and are least to be trusted and most to be feared of all political officials. It is good to question the federal leviathan, as we do here, and argue for the return to a degree of autonomy to the states. Indeed, the situation is so bad here in Texas that we no longer have a Republican form of government despite the constitutional guarantee. What is the requirement of a Republican form of government? Lawmaking by elected representatives. The right of the people to determine through our elected representatives, Texas's policy on abortion, capital punishment, prayer in the schools, sodomy, pornography, term limits, flag burning, and so on endlessly, are not made by the people of Texas. They're made all of us, all of us by the Supreme Court largely, in many cases, by Anthony Kennedy, who performs for us the function the Ayatollah performs in a room. <laughs> uh, Iran, Iran votes, Iran has elections, it's voting, legislatures, but which laws go into effect depends on the, um, you know, except for Kennedy, we, we could have term limits. Uh, except for Kennedy, we wouldn't have an individual right to own guns. Except for Kennedy, Congress could control co corporate campaign contributions. It's all Justice Kennedy. That's a great uh, denouement of what they, of they uh, uh, founders thought they were created, right? Uh, Franklin uh, legendarily said, uh, what, what form of government is? We created a republic if you can keep it. Well, I say we haven't kept it. That's not a republic. We rightly protest that our rights have been taken from us by the federal government. But they've been taken mostly not by Congress, but by the Supreme Court. To complain of alleged abuses of power by Congress 
whose members we vote into office, they can vote out of office. And accept the much greater and more serious abuses of power by the Supreme Court justices, unelected, light tenured, unremovable, before whom we stand helpless, is to strain at the gnat and swallow the camel. To not only fail to protest the justices' usurpation of legislative power, but to plead with them to protect us from Congress is to sharpen our executioner's acts. We do not need the court to protect us from Congress. We need the Congress to protect us from the court. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, although that's a very hard act to follow. Um, I am, as the judge pointed out, the only non-lawyer on this panel. Uh, and I'm surrounded by lawyers who are really eager to argue about affirmative action. Uh, so I'm going to step back a little bit uh, and talk not about uh, affirmative action, but about the type of regulatory regime that we've created in this country. <laughs> <laughs> what I just said was really quite brilliant, even though you didn't hear it. <laughs> uh, I'm going to step back and talk about the regulatory regime that we've created to uh, interpret and enforce civil rights laws in this country. Uh, and let me start with a puzzle that I've uh, long puzzled over as a political scientist. That is, why is it that there are uh, a number of policies related to preferential treatment on the basis of race and gender and employment and admissions in college that are highly unpopular with the public, but have become highly entrenched in public policy. Now, one possible answer to that is the one that we just heard, that is unelected judges. And in some cases, certainly with busing, that was the case. But there are other instances in which that was not the case. And to just quickly give one example that you're probably familiar with, disparate impact analysis in employment under Title VII. When the court started to pull back on some of the decisions Professor Roddy discussed, Congress passed the 1991 Civil Rights Act, um, really reinstating the type of disparate impact analysis that had, had uh, been challenged by the court. So let me, I want to say, I want to pull back and say, what is the type of regulatory regime that we've created to enforce and interpret civil rights? Um, it's a very complex web of rules of, of discrimination on the basis of race, gender, disability, age, language, um, that is uh, applied to virtually every employer in the country, every school in the country, every subnational government. Um, it's a very elaborate set of rules. Uh, comparative studies have shown that the civil rights state in the United States is much more extensive and much more effective than that in almost any other country. And that is in a country that's known for having a relatively weak state. I'm not going to try to give you a description of this whole array of arrangements, so I'm going to focus on Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and Title IX of the Education Amendments of 1972. Both of these provisions, as you know, discriminate, uh, prohibit discrimination by those who receive federal funds, Title VI on race and national origin, and Title IX on gender. Both were presented as administrative alternatives to very slow litigation. They were respond, they were an effort to try, let's not have case-by-case -case rulemaking by adjudication, let's not rely on this uh, litigation process that has taken more than 10 years to get any desegregation in the South. Let's have administrators do this. And then the administrators were given two powers. One was to terminate federal funds. Uh, for those who were engaging in discrimination. And the second was to establish rules uh, that established precisely what recipients had to do to comply. Uh, this rulemaking power was given to all agencies that handed out federal funds. Uh, and it was, there was a peculiar provision, which is, I think, quite rare, which was that the President of the United States had to approve all of these rules and orders. Now, this process that many people had a great deal of uh, uh, faith in, especially after we uh, passed the Education 
the elementary and the secondary education act of 1965, increasing the carrots for complying with desegregation, very quickly proved less effective than most people had expected. And that was for two reasons. One was the federal government almost never terminated federal funds. Even in the heyday of Southern school desegregation, there were only a handful of highly recalcitrant school systems whose funds were cut off. Uh, I believe that the total number of funding terminations under Title IX is zero. Uh, I gotta say that with the discussion before of coercion of uh, the use of federal funds strikes me as less um, compelling when you look how rarely the federal government actually does cut off federal funds. So that was one reason why uh, the act, uh, Title VI and Title IX turned out not to act, operate the way people expected. The other reason was because the other power given to these agencies was almost never used either. Um, uh, uh, the old HEW issued one set of formal rules under Title VI, I believe that was in 1965. Um, HEW issued one set of rules under Title IX in 1975. Um, and after that, they vowed they would never go through that process again. Um, those are the only time in which Office of Civil Rights at HEW or Department of Education ever issued rules that followed the procedures in the Act requiring presidential signature or going through any normal notice and comment rulemaking. So you'd think that this would be a regulatory failure. But in fact, that was not the case. Um, what happened? Well, uh, the, the process really became inverted. Um, the Office of Civil Rights, first in the Department of HEW, then in Education and in other uh, agencies, uh, found new ways to issue rules that skirted uh, the requirements of the Act. They issued interpretive guidelines, clarifications, dear colleague letters, clarifications of interpretations, and on and on, uh, not going through the regular process. Meantime, this is probably the most important change, the courts started to enforce the rules issued by administrative agencies. They found, uh, they turned a, a, a process that had been a substitute, an alternative to litigation, into a font of litigation, recognizing private rights of action to enforce these rules um, issued by federal agencies. Um, the process was therefore turned out to be very effective because courts have injunctions. Um, agencies didn't have to cut off funds. Uh, they could rely on the courts to say, you have to do all of these things. And this was really crucial for Southern school desegregation. That was the great victory of this form of policy making. But this form of policy making also led to something I call incremental interbranch leapfrogging. Um, and that's a very crude term, I, know, I don't think it's going to catch on. But, uh, but what I'm trying to get at is that, that each institution makes a little bit of change. The next institution builds that into its rules. Um, and then the next, and then we go around and around. Let me give you a couple of examples. Uh, one of them is a bilingual education you might be familiar with. Um, in the early 1970s, the Office of Civil Rights <coughs> issued very brief guidelines uh, saying that uh, children uh, who had English as a second language, uh, that if, if schools didn't provide some form of remedial help to them, that was a form of uh, discrimination on the basis of national origin. So they said schools have to have some kind of program to help students learn English. But they did nothing to enforce it, absolutely nothing. In Lau versus Nichols in 1975, the Supreme Court said, this is not only a proper reading of the statute, but we expect courts to enforce this. That meant that the agency could write regulations and not have to ex exert any political capital to enforce them. But the Office of Civil Rights responded by calling a convention, uh, convening a meeting, and saying, let's write really detailed regulations on big bilingual education, which they did. Those are called allow remedies. Uh, and then they left it federal district courts to enforce them, which federal district courts frequently did. Uh, let me give you that one other example of this kind of le inter uh, branch leapfrogging. I was reminded of this when I uh, passed uh, Daryl Royal Stadium because he hated these regulations. Uh, these were regulations of intercollegiate sports under Title IX. So I kind of take a number of steps to show how the regulations got 
more and more stringent. In 1975, AGW wrote regulations on intercollegiate athletics in the uh, uh, fairness to women, including 10 factors that schools had to take into account. When you have 10 factors you have to take into account, no one, of course, knows anything that they have to do. In 1979, the Carter administration uh, announced what they called their policy interpretation, leading to the so-called three-prong test, which created very strong incentives for creating more women's teams under Title IX. Now, regulation was, was paused for a while because of the Grove City controversy, um, but when that was resolved by an act of Congress, uh, in the early 1990s, there were two decisions of the First Circuit that took a very stringent interpretation of this policy interpretation. Now, you might have thought that these cases were about some highly recalcitrant, big-time football school. Um, but they were about Brown University. Uh, you know Brown University is known not for, for athletic excellence, but for uh, academic excellence and relatively liberal policies. But Brown University was told that they had not done nearly enough to increase the number of women's sports. In 1996, OC, the Office of Civil Rights, incorporated these more demanding requirements that had been established by the court and added a few of their own in the so-called clarification of the 1979 policy interpretation. Uh, and then in 2010, the Obama uh, Office of Civil Rights added a 13-page Dear Colleague letter with a key, a key section entitled Intercollegiate Athletics Policy Clarification, the Three-Part Test, Part Three. <laughs> so I think that's a good example of the way in which the, the, the regulations get a little more stringent over time. Uh, and we'll add one final element here. Uh, the next year, a district court in Connecticut had to address the key question of whether competitive tumbling in cheer can be considered a competitive sport. I think that ranks right up there with the Supreme Court's position on what are the inherent rules of golf. <laughs> now, I can tell a similar story in many different areas. Um, but I want to add one more element to this regulatory system that I'm describing. And that is, as we all know, in universities, in businesses, in state governments, uh, there are many offices that are uh, charged with monitoring compliance with all of these regulations. And one thing that sociologists and political scientists have found is that these offices tend to exaggerate greatly the threat of litigation under a wide variety of statutes. They do this to increase their leverage within the organization and because they really believe these things are good policy. Uh, but that is a further multiplier of the regulatory process. Uh, if you want a good example of that, read Stuart Taylor's book, the chapter on the ABA uh, uh, accreditation of law schools. Now, if you think that the rules that come out of this are a good thing, and my friend Sandy Levinson might think this is really quite a good thing, um, and you would say, well, this is a way in which progressive regulators, legislators, compliance officers can put together a set of protections that um, might go against popular prejudices. But the thing I want to point out is how much this system uh, inhibits any type of political accountability and any type of transparency. Um, it's really hard for anyone to know what the rules are and who is responsible for them because every institution says, I didn't really do this, I just followed the courts, I just followed the agency, I'm deferring to agency expertise, I'm deferring to the interpretation of the court, I'm deferring to Congress. Uh, so it's a great lack of accountability and transparency. Now, if you're concerned about this, what can we do? Well, one thing you could do was to say, well, the court should just not recognize private rights of action under these statutes. Um, and for a while, it looked like the Supreme Court might be moving in that direction. Uh, but it seems to me that now they've completely backed off. And I don't think that's particularly a uh, useful route anyway, because if, if the courts did not recognize private rights of action, Congress would amend the statutes and put them in. This is part of our legal culture. But what, uh, what courts and agencies can do is say, that if we're going to have a rulemaking process, we should have what we usually have for a rulemaking process. We should follow the law. We should have notice and comment rulemaking. We should have 
possibility for public participation. If the law says the president needs to sign these rules, we should do that. Uh, I think that would do a new, uh, take an enormous step towards increasing both transparency and accountability. And second, I think we, especially with those of us who are within universities, have a responsibility for not accepting everything that various offices of academic bureaucrats tell us we must do because of federal laws. Um, I think I would encourage you all, to, when you're told you have to do this because it's a federal regulation, to actually go read the regulation. And often, they're not quite as bad as we're told they are. Thank you. Good afternoon. Two very hard acts to follow, but I'd like to thank the Federalist Society, which I think uh, has done great things for uh, public discourse in America over the years, uh, for inviting me to speak on this important subject, and Justice Willett for managing the situation. Uh, I'm also privileged to be in the LBJ Auditorium, uh, given his work on behalf of civil rights. Uh, it was, um, I used to be able to visit now and then when I was covering the Supreme Court more full time with Justice Thurgood Marshall. And I know uh, from his public statements and conversation how he revered Justice uh, President Johnson. I'm basically saying he's the only president who ever did anything for us. And I remember in particular one of the presidents he didn't think ever did anything for us was, was FDR. Uh, I remember him talking about being on, on the line when FDR uh, made a pretty disgraceful uh, use of a racial epithet in the, court, in the course of a death penalty case. And so uh, I know Justice Marshall would not agree uh, with some of the things I'm going to say today, but, uh, but I revere him. Um, I'm going to focus uh, on the major themes of Rick Sanders in my book. I'll repeat the subtitle, the title's Mismatch, because it's descriptive. Uh, how affirmative action hurts students it's intended to help and why universities won't admit it is the subtitle. And I'll talk a little bit about the Supreme Court's pending affirmative action case and how the two relate and how they don't relate. I'll start with two points that may seem counterintuitive, then move to two proposed reforms of the racial preference regime that should not be controversial, I think, then to the Supreme Court case and then to the evidence underlying our book's title. Uh, the first point is that the most uh, harmed victims, in line with our uh, subtitle, of large racial preferences are the supposed beneficiaries, or many of them, African Americans, Hispanic Americans, Native American students who are admitted uh, to places, good students who are admitted to universities where they're competing against great students who are far better prepared. Uh, and uh, uh, we're not the first people who have pointed to this as a harm. Uh, Thomas Sowell did back in the early 70s, others did, Justice Thomas has. Uh, we like to think we contributed some uh, more empirical evidence than was in the record beforehand and, and brought attention to empirical evidence that was already in the record but that was widely overlooked. But I want to emphasize the point, this is not just an adjunct point that you make if you're really upset with racial preferences because they squeeze out some Asians, mainly Asians, by the way, and white people from being admitted to colleges they might otherwise get into. I think there's a case to be made against affirmative action on that basis, racial preferences more accurately. Uh, Abigail Fisher, the plaintiff in the Texas case, for example, uh, feels aggrieved that she had to go to Louisiana State and, and she had a family tradition at the University of Texas. Uh, my guess is she's suffered a setback, she's suffered an indignity. Her life will be fine. Or at least I don't think it will be blighted by the fact that, uh, that she didn't get into her first choice college. Possibly, it's not clear actually as a matter of evidence whether she would have gotten in without racial preferences. But even if that was true, uh, I think the harm to her is modest. Uh, on the other hand, I think the harm to some of the supposed beneficiaries of racial preferences is large, you know, and I'm going to elaborate on that. Uh, they're brought without warning into highly competitive settings where they are likely to struggle academically, become demoralized, fail, or barely squeak by, sometimes with long-lasting consequences. Uh, these students are victims of what my co-author Rick Sander and I call academic mismatch. They would do much better academically if the evidence we've seen shows uh, 
and would be better off in other ways, the evidence we think suggests, when you get down to career consequences and lifetime consequences, it's hard to make a strict evidentiary case, but I'd say suggests, uh, that they'd be better off if they attended somewhat less selective, but still very good schools for which they're well prepared. Um, and outpouring of social science evidence shows that this academic mismatch uh, phenomenon largely explains the following things. It explains why black students and to a lesser extent Hispanics tend to cluster toward the bottom of the class in college, law school, medical school. It explains why most who aspire to be science, pre-med, engineering majors end up fleeing to softer courses and pursuing careers other than the careers they had in mind when they started college. Um, it explains why black law graduates flunk the bar exam at four times the white rate, or more precisely, at twice the white rate, uh, I'm sorry, at twice the rate of whites who on entering law school appear to be their academic clones. Same LSAT scores, same college grades, et cetera. Very different bar passage outcomes and law school grade outcomes. Uh, and it explains why, according to surveys, uh, so many black university students, higher percentage than any other group, lack academic self-confidence and has suffer all the harms that flow from lacking academic self-confidence. As a result, we think we have many fewer black and Hispanic doctors, scientists, engineers, professors, and lawyers uh, than we would have if admission, admissions were race neutral. Many fewer is probably an overstatement, and the proof would be somewhat uh, difficult. I don't think our case depends on that proposition, so let me back off from it a little bit. I think there's a case to be made that you have fewer pe people than you would have in those categories. Uh, highly selective schools systematically deceive, I don't think the importance of this can be overstated, not to say defraud their affirmative action recruits by telling them, you're well qualified, you're gonna do fine, without disclosing to them that most will rank near the bottom of their class, those who are admitted based on large racial preferences I'm talking about, will be unable to pursue aspirations for careers in science, medicine, academia, or other professions other professions requiring exceptional academic performance. These universities conceal from racial preference recruits that their chances of success in such professional fields would be greater if they attended somewhat less selective schools where they would be more competitive with their classmates. Nor do the universities tell these students that if they flee tough courses for majors such as affirmative action, I'm sorry, such as African American studies, sociology, women's studies, even English, as it's taught today, they're less likely to get good jobs than if they did what, uh, if, than if they were taking tougher majors. This is not to deny that some black and Hispanic students can compete at the highest levels. Some obviously do. President Obama is a very conspicuous example. Uh, but those who receive large racial preferences, we contend, are being set up to fail, many of them. Their academic struggles have nothing to do with race as such, and everything to do with large preferences, which cause similar problems for some athletes and children of rich donors. After I gave a somewhat similar talk a while ago, I heard from a friend of mine, a college classmate of mine, who I won't name, who was a football recruit at, uh, at Princeton. He was uh, the best football player in our class, just about. He was white. And, uh, and he said, you know, I basically afterwards, he said, I, I was a victim of mismatch. It caused me a lot of a lot of heartache while I was in college and after. I, I wouldn't have guessed that that would have been true, but that's what he said. My second counterintuitive point is that racial preferences cause a net loss in racial diversity in higher education as a whole. The loss in racial diversity has a goal. How can that be? Well, nobody or almost nobody who now goes to college would be knocked out of college if there were no racial preferences. The black students who go to the most prestigious schools would go to somewhat less prestigious schools, and so on down the line. There wouldn't be fewer black students in college. There would be fewer black students at the most prestigious colleges. There would be less racial diversity, if you will, there. There would be more racial diversity farther down, uh, farther down the academic prestige pecking order, and it would be a healthier diversity because the students would all be there based on, uh, based on their performance rate and, and whatever else is considered rather than on their race. Um, 
The, uh, another point is that even apart from the mismatch problem, the current racial uh, preference regime makes economic inequality worse, not better. How could that be? Well, probably, I, I think the numbers show that the average black student racial preference beneficiary, if you will, uh, is probably less wealthy in a place like Texas than the average white student, but pretty wealthy on the scale of the American population, even The Shape of the River, the book by uh, Bowen and Bark, that's the kind of the Bible, the pro affirmative action Bible, says that I think 86% of the racial preference recipients uh, that in their study uh, were uh, upper class, upper middle class, or middle class. Um, they are being accepted, those who are accepted with racial preferences, over the heads of better qualified, less wealthy children of Asian cab drivers, white plumbers, other working class kids. If your cause in life, if your concern is and socioeconomic inequality getting worse, and there's a lot of evidence in this country that it is, uh, I submit that the racial preference regime, as we know it now, not as it originated in the 60s, as we know it now, is making the socioeconomic inequality problem worse, not better. Um, I wonder, by the way, whether Justice Sotomayor understood this when she wrote in her new book that the purpose of affirmative action, at least when she was young, was, quote, to create the conditions whereby students from disadvantaged backgrounds could be brought to the starting line of a race many were unaware was even being run, end quote. Uh, not now. It isn't really about disadvantage anymore. It's kind of about something else, but Justice Sotomayor has given no indication since she wrote the book uh, that, that she understands that. It will be interesting to see when the Fisher case comes out whether she addresses that issue. As for our proposed reforms, the first is to require that the operation and effects of universities' racial conscious admissions and other preference programs be totally transparent and fully disclosed to minority applicants and everybody else. That this is, in, in the first instance, a consumer protection measure. Applicants and their parents ought to know what they're getting into. If you are being accepted to a school where the median SAT score is 300 or 400 points higher than yours is, uh, and if there's evidence that shows that people who have come in the past with that, with that kind of a gap have not done so well academically, well, people ought to know that. They're certainly not being told that now. They're being told the opposite now. Second, and, and also as a public policy, uh, health, to make healthy public policy, uh, legislators, judges, regents, everybody involved in decision making on this issue, university presidents ought to, ought to know how it works, what the real effects are. As of now, these are all closely guarded secrets. As far as I know, uh, no university in the country, with the possible exception of the University of Texas, actually, uh, has, has made these kinds of numbers public, and the University of Texas has certainly not advertised them. Second major reform would be the Supreme Court should require universities to give priority to socioeconomic equality over racial identity by allowing a school's racial preferences to be no larger than its socioeconomic preferences for less advantaged students. I've never heard a coherent objection to either proposed reform, except that many critics of racial preferences, uh, who generally speaking, like, uh, like the facts in our book, fault us for stopping short of urging the justices to outlaw racial preferences in state programs. And I understand that objection, and I'll address it in a minute. How does our book relate to the Fisher case, which, by the way, we did file an amicus, an amicus brief, making the same essential points as the book? While Fisher, generally speaking, seems a reasonable bet to become the biggest affirmative action case ever, largely because of changes in the court's composition since the 19, since the 2003 University of Michigan cases, suggests that the current majority, conservative majority, if you will, took this case to tighten the very flaccid restrictions on the racial preference regime that pervade hundreds of selective universities across America, restrictions that the court has previously articulated. It's talked of a good game about saying you can't overdo this sort of thing, but it hasn't really enforced anything. It says you can't have quotas, and then it allows de facto quotas as long as they're disguised. For example, 
The stakes are very large. Hundreds of organizations and groups representing virtually all major establishment institutions, from academia to corporate America to members of Congress, have filed a total of 73 amicus briefs supporting the university's racial preference regime. By contrast, only 17 briefs have been filed on Abby Fisher's side, mostly by small conservative advocacy groups. This really is kind of a David, uh, not to say that David is the good guy, well, is the bad guy, but all of the institutional power in this country is pro-racial preference, which is a, illustrates a stunning disconnect um, on this issue between establishment opinion and popular opinion, which disapproves of racial preferences by wide margins and has consistently since, since the system started. The court gave a sort of green light to racial preferences if structured as part of a so-called holistic admission system rather than as an over numerical quota in 2003 in Grutter versus Bollinger, which was a 5-4 five, five, decision involving University of Michigan Law School. But Justice O'Connor, author of the opinion, has since retired and replaced by Justice Alito. And that's the swing that uh, leads people to expect a different outcome here. Justice Anthony Kennedy is now the crucial swing vote. Five of the current justices, including Kennedy, would have struck down the University of Michigan Law School reference regime that O'Connor upheld in Bruder. But only four of those, Thomas, Scalito, I'm sorry, Thomas, Scalito, Alito, and Roberts, have called for or seem likely to favor outlawing racial preferences and admissions entirely. Justice Kennedy, therefore, seems likely once again to write the law of the land in Fisher, whether whether he's the Ayatollah or not, he's got the power. Uh, in Bruder, Kennedy provided a sixth vote for the court's first ever holding that the educational benefits of racial diversity provide a compelling interest that can justify racial preferences at state schools if narrowly tailored to serve that interest. But he also assailed the majority for giving far, much deference, far too much deference to the law school's judgments and said that its racial preference regime failed to enforce the majority's own narrow tailoring principles and he's never voted to uphold a racial preference. Uh, what will he do in this case? There's a lot of speculation. I think most close court watchers expect them to strike down the Texas plan, but maybe on a ground, narrow ground, that would apply to Texas only, which is you have the 10% plan, you get a lot of racial diversity from that, that's enough. You don't need individual preferences too. If they do that, it will have very little effect nationwide. Or will they do something bigger? Uh, it's unclear. Um, it seems doubtful that Justice Kennedy is going to say you can't consider race at all. Uh, where could they come down in between no race at all and or the same what they've done before? Rick Sander and I think that our views um, may have a lot of common with it, what Justice Kennedy said so far, and therefore we hope that he might move in the direction that we recommend, not because we recommend it, but because of a certain uh, because he seems, it seems like the logical direction for him to move in. Uh, for example, he stressed that racial preferences must not unduly harm members of any racial group, and that universities may consider race only if racial neutral, race neutral alternatives cannot produce adequate diversity. These views resonate with two central theses of our book. Those are that the current racial preference regime unduly harms members of every racial group, the Supreme Court's never openly considered the idea that it might harm the supposed beneficiaries, but their decisions have proceeded, proceeded on the implicit assumption that it's nothing but good for the beneficiaries, supposed beneficiaries. And we hope that Justice Kennedy uh, may be willing to re-examine that premise. Um, we dare not hope that Kennedy or the court will see our book or our amicus brief as irrefutable, given that many highly credentialed scholars have purported to refute us. And the lower court record in Fisher is devoid of any mention of mismatch or harm, other harms to intended beneficiaries. So you can only expect so much of the Supreme Court in a case with this record. But we do hope at least to dispel from the minds of any open-minded justices and other readers the now unsustainable notion racial preferences are an unqualified benefit from their supposed beneficiaries. Why, some ask, shouldn't the justices leave university admissions to the wisdom of the academics? In my view, both academics and politicians have demonstrated that if they're left to their own devices, we're likely to have an ever more pervasive regime of racial preferences in every walk of American life forever. I won't 
try to document that now, but to give one little example, some of you may remember the Supreme Court saying in the 2003 Michigan case, uh, Michigan cases, that racial preferences in admission should end in no more than 25 years. Ten of those years have now passed. <coughs> Not one university in America has given the slightest indication that it intends ever to uh, reduce, let alone eliminate, its use of racial preferences. And Attorney General Holder has come very close to saying that racial preferences are corrupt. That's the direction things are moving in. Uh, by the way, not one prominent American politician has been daring enough to publicly uh, make a major critique of affirmative action in, since 1996, the California campaign. No national politician has been willing to go out on that limb because of the publicity, I think, that would, uh, would, uh, that would fall to him. Um, I, uh, I was going to mention, but I'll leave it for Q&A if anyone wants to talk about it. Why, given the harsh critique Rick Sander and I make of affirmative action of racial preferences and admissions, why don't we just call for outlawing those practices? And we have some reasons which I can come back to. But I want to quickly tick off some of the evidence laid out in our book on which we base the theories I've been talking about. And I want to emphasize that most of this evidence that I'm going to state rests on a foundation of facts that are undisputed among experts, including fashion support of affirmative action, although hidden from view by academia, the news media, and the government, and thus surprising to many news consumers. First, almost all schools routinely use very large racial preferences, leading to racial gaps of 200 to 400 points in mean SAT scores within the student body, or two-thirds of a full grade point of high school GPA among admitted students. For, among, for example, since we're in Texas, among freshmen entering UT in 2009 who were admitted outside the top 10% system, a staggering 467 points out of a possible 2,400 separated the mean SAT scores of Asians from those of blacks admitted with explicit preferences. The black-white gap was 390 points, which, if you do the math, leaves a not insubstantial 77 point gap between Asians and whites. By the way, uh, the numbers in selective schools all over the country conclusively establish a fairly uniform regime of discrimination against Asians, uh, very redolent to what was done with Jews in the 20s at uh, Harvard, Yale, and so forth. The racial gaps in high school GPAs of these freshmen largely mirror the SAT gaps. Second, in selective universities as a group, half of the black students rank in the bottom 20% of their classes in college and in the bottom 10% of their classes in law school. And black dropout rates are, although not that high, uh, in the most prestigious places, uh, get higher as you go down the, down the chain and are a multiple of white dropout rates. Third, as I noted earlier, many black students who aspire to pursue careers that demand success in rigorous academic courses such as science, engineering, medicine, and academia, uh, end up doing badly in these tough courses, the softer courses end up not pursuing the aspirations that they, uh, that they uh, had brought to college with them. One leading study, for example, found that blacks who entered elite schools with aspirations to be science, technology, engineering, and math majors were only slightly more than half as likely as whites to finish college with STEM degrees. Fourth, so far undisputed studies show that these students would have far better chances of sticking with science and achieving their goals if they attended colleges for which they were well qualified. Uh, this evidence includes data showing that black grades and graduation rates improved markedly at the University of California after Proposition 209 banned racial preferences there. Uh, Race-blind admissions challenged many good but not not stellar black and Hispanic students to the less selective UC campuses who had previously have gone to Berkeley, UCLA, and they did better at the less selective camp campuses than people like them had done before at the flagship campuses. Fifth, contrary to an often repeated myth, affirmative action recipients do not gain ground academically on their classmates during the four, year co four college years or during the three law school years. They tend to fall further behind. Six, even when one compares black and white students with very similar academic credentials on entering law school, I see I'm out of time, so I'm going to stop, uh, the blacks are about twice as likely to flunk the bar exam and end up without license to 
practice law. I repeat, the, large, the above facts are largely undisputed among experts. Critics of our book and of mismatch theory generally do claim that many highly credentialed empiricists have refuted our contentions. But in fact, for the most part, no such refutation has even been attempted, except for the attacks on uh, my co-author Rick Sanders' work on law school mismatch. And that's a long and complicated argument that I'll leave to the future. And thank you for your time and patience. Out of wedlock birth rate is now about 75% for African Americans. 
Uh, it's almost 30% for whites, uh, but it's only about 18%. Think of that, I'm saying only about 18% uh, for Asians. For that not to have a profound effect on rates of misbehavior would take a miracle. Second, what if the cost of failing to discipline misbehaving students falls on the misbehaving students themselves, or for example, on their fellow African American students who are trying to learn amid classroom disorder? Will unleashing the Department of Education's Office of Civil Rights and its army of lawyers cause those schools to tolerate more classroom disorder and thus make it more difficult for students who share a classroom with unruly students to learn? It just might. Here's where a dollop of conservative values could <coughs> apply. Trying to control a nuanced, fact-specific issue like school discipline from inside the Beltway is just impossible. Even the most well-meaning of federal edicts tends to be devoid of nuance by the time it reaches the foot soldiers on the ground. In this case, of course, the classroom teachers. Don't discipline misbehaving students who happen to be Afri African American unless you have good reason. Now that sounds like a very sensible policy for the Department of Education to be pursuing. But think how that's going to be interpreted down the line. That kind of rule is naturally going to be understood by school district administrators as don't do it unless you're confident that you can persuade some federal investigator whose judgment you have no reason to trust that you have good reason to do it. In turn, that's going to be communicated to the actual <coughs> principals of the schools as don't discipline African American students unless you jump through the following procedural hoops that we've laid down in order to assist us in convincing that future federal investigator whose judgment we have no reason to trust, that we've done the right thing. In turn, that's going to be translated by the principal to the classroom teacher as just don't do it. It will only get us in trouble. And indeed, the US Commission on Civil Rights conducted a briefing on this very issue where we had teachers testifying exactly to that point. Now, if and when, to discipline little Johnny, if that's not, uh, if that's not a local issue, um, then I don't know what is. Um, if James Madison were alive today, he would surely be astonished um, at what has become uh, a federal issue. It is entirely possible that the way schools discipline children today needs improvement. I am willing to stipulate to that uh, for the sake of this discussion. But to look at it as a federal issue um, or as a race issue, I would submit as a big mistake. Now combine this with the Department of Education's policies on sexual harassment and schoolyard bullying. Um, in the name of sexual harassment, which is argued to be a form of discrimination within the meaning of Title VI, we now call the police. Uh, when a kindergartner, when a kindergartner gets too familiar uh, with the teacher's chest. Um, in the name of stopping bullying against gay students, um, which is also argued to be a form of sex discrimination within the meaning of Title VI. The federal government gives one side of the culture wars uh, a cudgel to use against the other. Now bullying, of course, schoolyard bullying, is a real problem. Um, it's just not one that can be effectively dealt with at the federal level. Rather than let the schools deal with it, we create a bureaucratic maze for educators and a thriving gravy train for bullying and harassment seminar providers who state the obvious to educators, but offer them some level of protection from the inevitable Title VI lawsuits uh, and Title IX lawsuits. In the end, it's hard to know who's the real bully in these cases. Often it's the federal leviathan itself. But let's move to employment, because I believe it's a tribute to the resilience of the American people that anybody gets hired anymore. Um, <laughs> I'm talking to a bunch of law students. I know that can hurt. Um, um, we must never lose sight of the fact that complex laws regulating the employment relationship encourage employers to take jobs overseas. It is the least skilled among us who are hurt most by this. 
Every time we limit the ability of employers and employees to work it out for themselves, we need to be very, very sure that the benefits of that regulation uh, do indeed outweigh its costs. We all, of course, remember when Martin Luther King looked forward to the day that his children could be judged by the content of their character rather than the color of their skin. Instead, the law as it exists today does precisely the opposite. Um, in 1979, the Supreme Court case of United Steelworkers versus Weber, uh, we learned that despite Title VII's clearly symmetrical language, uh, it's okay um, for employers to discriminate in favor of minorities after all. On the other hand, um, under EEOC guidelines promulgated just last year, uh, it is illegal in most cases for an employer to decline to hire an applicant because he has a criminal record. Uh, if there is one matter um, of record of which a person, one matter of record about a person that lets you know something about the content of their character, I would submit it as whether he has a criminal record. The idea appears to have been to benefit young black males who are more likely to have a criminal record than, say, elderly Asian females. Uh, but it may be backfiring. Um, there's already some empirical evidence that young black males may be worse off under the new guidance. Um, if an employer cannot check, he may err on the side of caution and not hire from pools that he believes may be of higher risk. Imagine a small businessman with 10, say, full-time jobs that are suitable for a young person with no special training, entry-level jobs. He hires 10 people who are a mix of recent high school grads, few high school dropouts, eight of the 10 end up being African-American males, maybe. And it's fine, he's checked out their criminal record. It turns out one of his applicants did have a record, he decided not to take a chance, but he did decide to hire some high school dropouts who he had some confidence in. If he follows the EEOC guidelines, that employer may decide um, that he needs to forego the checks. If he decides he can't afford the risk, he may decide he's gonna hire, instead of 10 full-time workers, 30 part-time college students from a local elite university, knowing that the odds of any of them having a criminal record are very much smaller than the pool he'd previously been hiring from. Out of the 30, maybe one is African-American, uh, and his father's a neurologist from a <coughs> county suburb. Some of you may be scratching your head and wondering how it is that it could be a violation of Title VII, which after all bans discrimination based on race, sex, religion, national origin, and color in employment, to consider a criminal, criminal record in, in hiring. But if that's what you're thinking, as Lino has already pretty outlined for you, uh, it's time to pay much closer attention to this area of the law. Those who supported the new guidance um, on criminal background checks to them, this seems like a very ordinary application of Title VII, and the problem is they're not entirely wrong on that. If you accept disparate impact as an appropriate theory of liability under Title VII, it's easy to get there. That's the problem. The EEOC took the position early on uh, that Title VII prohibits not just conscious and unconscious intentional discriminatory treatment, but also job qualifications that have a disparate impact that cannot be justified by, quote, business necessity, um, a term that is never adequately defined. Um, alas, in the notorious case of Griggs versus Duke Power, the Supreme Court tentatively accepted that analysis. Um, and when it tried to back away more than a decade later, Congress uh, adopted, or at least arguably adopted, uh, a disparate, disparate impact analysis as part of Title VII. The problem with this analysis, despite the fact that it was contradicted by the text of Title VII and by statements in the legislative history, um, who said that employers could have whatever job qualification they wanted, so long as it wasn't race, color, sex, national origin, or religion, uh, the problem is that all job qualifications have disparate impact on some group. Job qualifications that require heavy lifting have a disparate impact on women. Job qualifications that require the ability to do fine handwork, those have a disparate impact on men who tend to have bigger and more awkward hands. Um, job, jobs requiring experience in the donut industry will tend to advantage Cambodian Americans um, over other ethnic groups. Jobs that require uh, experience in the cultivation of winter wheat, or is it summer wheat? I always get those two mixed up. Uh, will tend to have um, a, 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 a disparate benefit, and hence a disparate um, impact, uh, but the benefit goes to 
Wait for it, Scandinavian Americans, and hence Lutherans. <laughs> <laughs> the upshot of this is that all employment qualifications are potentially illegal. No employer that announces uh, that it has any clear job qualification can feel safe. They just have to keep their heads down and hope that they don't get caught in the crosshairs um, of the EEOC's um, litigation. Um, if you think this is good for American competitiveness, that virtually all things an employer uh, can, can do can get them in trouble, uh, I would urge you to think again. Um, at one point, the EEOC, as well as Congress, um, would have responded to this by saying, well, don't worry, we're really only concerned with disparate impact that negatively impacts women, African Americans, and maybe, maybe Hispanics, uh, and these days, maybe Muslims. Um, but even within that limitation, just about every job qualification um, is going to have a disparate impact on somebody. More importantly, I think, if that's the way the system works, um, and you know that's, that's, that's what they have said, it may well be unconstitutional, since it would have to be justified by a compelling purpose and narrowly tailored uh, to achieve that purpose, at least with regard to the racial issues. And it's not at all clear that Congress or the EEOC um, can make that argument. In the most recent important case on disparate impact, um, that was Ricci versus De Stefano. Uh, Justice Scalia, writing in concurrence, practically begged somebody uh, to bring a case that would present the issue of disparate impact constitutionality. Uh, nevertheless, uh, promoting disparate impact theory has become a priority for the Obama administration. The Department of Justice has employed disparate impact theory to insist um, that under the Equal Credit Opportunity Act, lenders, for example, can't have minimum loan size sizes. Last week, HUD issued a new rule applying disparate impact theory to the Fair Housing Act, so now landlords will have to come up with tenant qualifications um, that won't have disparate impact. Um, I think it's, it's possible, even likely, that this latter extension will find its way to the Supreme Court um, very shortly. There's a case pending that may, may, well, um, may well present that. I'm probably running out of time, so I just wanted to add one more area um, where we are seeing a backfire um, in who actually ends up being helped. Dr. Melnick mentioned the Title IX guidances um, for, for women um, and sports. You know, um, it has now gotten to the point under the Department of Education's um, guidances uh, that it is cheaper for schools to discriminate against women at the admissions, at the input level, at the admissions level, than it is for them to finance uh, the athletic programs that Title IX requires them um, to undertake. Uh, you may know these days uh, there are more women in college than there are in men, and mid-level liberal arts co colleges in particular uh, have a lot more women applying than they do men. Well, if they've got twice as many women, that means they have to spend $2 for every $1 they spend on athletics for men, unless they can come, come within certain other parts of the guidance that are basically impossible uh, to comply with. So what happens? Schools simply find it easier to discriminate against women uh, at the intake level. And at least for some schools, that's legal. Private liberal arts schools at the undergraduate level uh, can do that, and so they do. Public schools, unfortunately, are also doing it, uh, and it's not legal for them to do it. The U.S. Commission on Civil Rights tried to inquire into this. We had um, going a, a very large empirical study. Unfortunately, when the Obama appointees came to the commission, uh, they canceled the study, so we won't actually get, get to know the extent to which women are being discriminated against in admissions. Um, but um, it is largely the result um, of convoluted um, convoluted efforts to be good to women uh, that end up backfiring. Um, I better stop. year's 
um, event and of the illustration, the Federal Leviathan and the illustration from Hobbes. I happen to think that Hobbes is the greatest political theorist in the English language um, and um, can hold his own among any languages. Um, but he has a very distinctive theory of politics, and the Leviathan state is an all powerful state. Um, and it really does strike me as um, uh, hyperbolic to view American government as all powerful, either descriptively or theoretically. If one, however, is going to suggest that the United States is becoming more Hobbesian every day, then I'm surprised that there was a panel this weekend on the national security, the national surveillance state, uh, which is an area, incidentally, where one might find interesting overlaps between uh, some conservatives and some liberals. Um, it's no coincidence that Hobbes was obsessed by the issue of security um, and might well have been sympathetic to the notion that there are literally no limits to state power if uh, preserving national security is the aim. Uh, that has all sorts of implications. Um, four or five years ago, we uh, would have been discussing excesses in the Bush administration. There are, unfortunately, uh, similar excesses in the Obama administration, all in the name of protecting the American people from various threats. And that is certainly worth discussing if one is interested in the Leviathan state. Uh, whatever one thinks of uh, federal power and the issue of bullying, it does seem to me a relatively minor example of the Abesian state uh, as against, say, drones and at least the theoretical power of the president to order attacks on anyone, including an American citizen, who is deemed to be a threat to national security or to be aligned with foreign um, interests. Um, I also think, frankly, that there is an interesting tension, perhaps even schizophrenia, within the, this program, perhaps the Federalist Society, right now, because reading the title, one is tempted to think that the problem is an all-powerful national government. Uh, but a number of the policies we're talking about, including affirmative action in the 21st century, uh, these are decisions made rightly or wrongly. And although I support affirmative action, I will say I'm an ambivalent supporter. I think many of the criticisms made uh, uh, including those uh, by Stuart Taylor are very serious ones by my colleague, uh, Lena Gralia, certainly have to be wrestled with. But just look at the caption of the case. It's Fisher versus the University of Texas. Um, it was Grutter versus the University of Michigan. Um, these policies are adopted rightly or wrongly uh, by state level institutions, uh, which are in a variety of ways more accountable than national level institutions. Uh, so what I think we need to wrestle with is actually contemplated in the very last paragraph of the welcome. I uh, actually take titles very seriously, and I read things like uh, mission statements. Um, and so this, this ends finally, while this conference focused to a large degree on the federal government, it will also explore how many of these problems are just as serious or more serious at the state level. In other words, in each of the areas touched on by our panels is the problem of federal government problem or a challenge posed by government at any level. I think it's an excellent question, uh, but I think that there is a huge difference between a focus on federalism, as the term is usually used, that is to say the allocation of decision-making power between national and state governments and a preference for decision-making at a local level, and libertarianism. I see my friend John Rowland uh, in the uh, front row. Uh, I don't mean as an insult to him, because I think he himself would describe himself as a radical libertarian. Uh, who doesn't particularly care at the end of the day whether excesses of government cap power come from national government or state governments. I'm not a libertarian. He and I would certainly disagree on what would count as excesses of government power, but it should be obvious that there is a chasm between people whose basic thrust is libertarian and who are really suspicious of any and all exertions of government power, regardless 
of the source and those who are particularly upset at an intrusive national government for a variety of reasons, but will gladly accept the same sorts of policies if they come from state or local governments. Um, and it does seem to me this might be a very useful topic for perhaps next year's student um, convention. To what degree is contemporary, contemporary federalist society more libertarian or more federalist? So that raises another point. I was somewhat uh, interested in Gail's comment that James Madison were alive today. Um, he'd be astonished at what is considered a federal issue. That's certainly true. Everybody would be astonished at contemporary uh, politics. But I do think, and I've chided my friend Steve Calabrese, and I mean that. It's not, it's not like being a senator referring to a, his good friend. <laughs> uh, I actually know Steve and follow Steve. But I've chided him for years that I think the federal society is engaging in a kind of false advertising, first of all, by their name which evokes the Federalist or the Federalist Papers of Madison, Hamlet, and Jay, which were, at least the last time I read them, which was literally this past week from teaching a course to them, um, uh, certainly a payoff to a stronger national government. And the James Madison of 1787, not the James Madison of 1798, to be sure, but the James Madison of 1790, 1787 and 1788 was writing the Federalist Papers, really didn't think much of states at all. The 10th Federalist is the most eloquent attack on states ever written, precisely because states are so much more likely to be captured by factions than the national government. Now, you know, we may or may not argue about the validity of that perception, um, but I have always wondered, and I've asked Steve, why the Federal Society simply doesn't name itself, rename itself the Anti-Federalist Society, <laughs> and emphasize that the Madison, Madison's picture is the 1798 James Madison, and not the 1787 um, James Madison. Um, uh, but be that as it may, the question is, is there any area of modern life in which federal government power does not extend? Sure, there are many of them, but let me just give one. Uh, that is the McDonald case. Uh, I have publicly described in the posting on balkanization the best 11-page opinion ever written was written by Frank Easterbrook uh, for the Seventh Circuit, um, uh, pointing out that if you like federalism, you will leave regulation of an area like guns, which present all sorts of conflicts of values and conflicts of empirical data, you will leave that up to local levels. Uh, this was written, obviously, before McDonald. It's a brilliant opinion. Frank is very, very brilliant. And last time I was with him, I think it was at a federal society gathering. And unlike me, he was invited because he was thought to be a real federalist um, and not simply somebody to provide, perhaps, a different point of view. Uh, so I mean, we can look at others, but the point of mentioning Howard McDonald is that you know, for better and for worse, uh, liberals and conservatives will probably have different views on a whole number of issues. Uh, there's all sorts of protection by federal courts with regard to state regulation. Um, and it's just, I think, unduly tendentious to ask the question, is there any area of modern life to which federal government power does not extend? Um, and I don't have the time, fortunately, to get into the world famous broccoli. Um, issue that consumed us uh, last year. Um, but in some ways, you know, I have, there are things in which I agree with everybody who has spoken and undoubtedly have some disagreements, but, um, but I've been listening very carefully. And let me just emphasize a few comments from uh, my colleague, Lina Bramia. Uh, I presume that a lot of people, particularly at the University of Texas, will put Lino and myself at opposite ends of the spectrum, and sometimes we are with regard to policy issues. Um, uh, but just, you know, let me remind you of some of the things he said. He, he began his remarks by pointing out the misfortune that the United States Supreme Court in 1883 overruled or invalidated the Civil Rights Act of 1875. Um, obviously, and not, not surprisingly, I think he's absolutely right, 
Um, the uh, 1875 Act was predicated not on the Commerce Clause. It didn't raise all of the questions that law professors can argue about endlessly about the limits of Congress. It was predicated on the 13th and 14th Amendment, as it should have been. Uh, they're called the Reconstruction Amendments, after all, uh, which means the allocation of new powers to the national government in order to protect people who have been victimized by state government. Um, and the Supreme Court said no, and said no unwisely. Um, we could argue you know, all year about the one true meaning of Brown. I don't think there is a one true meaning of Brown. Uh, within two paragraphs, the, you find the court saying separate schools are inherently unequal. And then about an inch or two further down the page, you find a very different sentence saying to separate them uh, will generate um, uh, injuries to hearts and minds. To separate suggests intentionality. It suggests agency. S simply separate schools suggests that intentions or purposes have nothing to do with it. Rather, uh, social science data would indicate that uh, separate schools, whatever the motivation, whatever the history, are unequal and detrimental. We can argue about this all day. That brings me to Stuart Taylor's extremely interesting uh, comments. Um, um, and you know, I will concede there are possibilities that Stuart is absolutely right. Um, but I do think that it raises a very, very important issue to what extent do we want federal judges? I'm probably a bit less hostile to federal judges as a group than Lino is. Uh, but I certainly would not describe myself as a huge fan of, uh, I hate to use the term judicial activism because it has no real meaning, uh, but judges, overreaching judges. Uh, the truth is that there's no member of the current Supreme Court who can be called an apostle of judicial restraint. Uh, and there are a few people in the legal academy. Lino comes closest, because uh, I hold it very much in his favor that about three years ago, uh, at another Federalist gathering, maybe perhaps longer than that, he actually defended um, the view that Congress basically can do whatever it wants under the Congress Clause, and that the so-called federalism revolution was a very, very bad idea indeed. It didn't cost, it's never cost me anything to make arguments like that. But Lino, I'm sure, shocked some of his friends who expected a different sort of approach to federal power. Um, and, but generally speaking, uh, you know, there, there is a real problem with calls, uh, uh, description of judicial activism or judicial Restraint, but the problem I really have with Stewart's argument is that it's one thing if one is talking about um, interpreting the Constitution, does it or does it not allow racial classifications? And all of us know the arguments about that. Uh, the text says nothing about race. Um, and then there are people who look at history or doctrine. And you know, again, we can argue about this till the cows come home. Uh, but at least you might argue, I'm not a particular devotee in this argument, you might argue that Supreme Court justices are especially skilled in figuring out how to resolve genuinely complex issues of constitutional meaning. I do not believe that Supreme Court justices or lawyers more generally have any particular <coughs> skills in resolving complicated empirical issues. Um, uh, that is, what does the regression analysis show? Um, um, you know, as I say, I, I haven't come here to attack Stewart's argument, in part because I don't know enough to attack it, but I also have to say that much of what he says sounds fairly plausible. But I do know that there are people uh, who have attacked it. He mentioned that the act, act particular Eric Sanders' views of law school admissions. And you get into the problem of footnote 11 of Brown versus the Board of Education, which did not do the court any good. And one could argue that it didn't do the country much good. That is to say, uh, the, you know, it's hard to say it's an empirical matter that the court was relying on the <coughs> arts, Dahl studies. But they included references to the Dahl studies 
And then that provoked a huge literature thereafter about what's the relationship between the majestic meaning of the 14th Amendment and controversial studies of the presentation of dolls to uh, black kids. Um, and part of this methodological argument, who's, who, get, who has it right about the methodology of the doll studies and the methodology of the um, affirmative action. But another part is to say, you know, this is why we hire legislators the, the, to listen to hearings, to have Rick Sander uh, testify, to have Stewart testify. Uh, these are going to be complicated, and they can come to some conclusion on what overall is sound public policy. And quite frankly, um, uh, I, I don't look forward to more and more decision making by a judiciary, state or federal, I have to say, that really turns on uh, controversial empirical issues unless we start educating our students better than we do in how to assess empirical materials. I mean, for many years, I've all, uh, I also have a degree in political science, and it's, it's true, I'm a lawyer, but in my sunset years, I think my original identity as a political scientist is, is taking precedence, and I think that in the modern world, law students should know how to analyze statistics, or should know uh, at least the basics of what an aggression analysis looks like. Uh, and we don't teach you that. And you know, I suspect that there's no member of the current Supreme Court who's comfortable with empirical data. Um, and I think this is a real problem in calling on the court to make a judgment uh, on the basis of uh, controversial uh, data. Um, a final point, because um, I, I do hope we have some time for, for questions from you. Um, I would sign on in a second to Stewart's deal. That is, just get rid of racial preferences and replace them with a truly vigorous attempt to overcome the ever-increasing inequality in American society. But that means redistribution, and that means raising taxes. And I, you know, not surprisingly, I'm going to be the only person on this panel, I'm not sure um, uh, about Chef on this, who would unabashedly, uh, and, and Stuart, I'd be interested, but you know, unabashedly support uh, redistributive programs and higher taxes. But that's what we're talking about, I think, if we try seriously to address the class issues that Stuart correctly highlights. Um, uh, race and ethnicity is a poor proxy <coughs> for class. Maybe the fact that it's a poor proxy, I think, doesn't make it a non-proxy. I think we wildly have to overestimate the number of sons and daughters of neurosurgeons, uh, um, uh, minority students, right, sons and daughters, uh, professionals um, um, at elite schools. Uh, but I think there's a, a very real point there. It's simply that if one takes it seriously, it requires a kind of politics we do not now have, and one, frankly, that is not usually associated with the federal society. I do want to thank uh, our entire pretty high octane quintet of panelists. We've heard a pretty healthy, robust mix and breadth of use today. By the way, if anybody is sort of live tweeting the panel, I know some of you are because I've seen it. My hashtag, no, my hashtag, my handle is at Justice Willett. But two T's. The name tag only has one, but two T's. Right, Jenna? That's right. At Justice Willett. All right. Uh, I do want to safeguard our Q&A time. I'm also mindful we got the reception beginning in a few minutes, but people have stepped up. Is anybody chomping at the bit to respond to anything? One of your co-panelists has said? You know, to say, uh, we can argue forever, uh, Sandy tells us, we can argue forever about the meaning of Brown. You know, uh, we can't argue forever about the meaning of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. 
You know, what, what, what the Constitution, Constitution says nothing about segregation, desegregation, integration, right? Uh, but, this, but the 1964 Civil Rights Act couldn't be more clear. Now, as a matter of fact, we can argue about the meaning of Brown. We can't argue about what it was understood to mean. Congress understood it to mean no racial discrimination. That's what everybody understood it to mean. And that wasn't difficult. The Brown case itself, with its footnote 11, is complex. But at the same time, the same day, they decided another case, Bowling v. Sharp, involving segregation in the District of Columbia, and they decided on straight no race discrimination grounds. So, you know, we can argue about anything. But what the Brown was, was understood to mean from the beginning is really not very arguable. But I'm happy to see Sandy come out against judicial activism and he would leave this thing to the process. I hope he had said that sometime about abortion. I hope he had said that, you know, uh, uh, President Obama, it's outrageous, it shows what we are. President Obama, the people of California should not decide the question of same-sex marriage. He says the Supreme Court should decide it for them. The president of the country wants to take every basic social issue out of the hands of the people and it should be decided by the Supreme Court. I hope Sandy opposes that as much as he opposes their deciding uh, the affirmative action issue. Okay, with nine people at different microphones, if we could, I guess, take about a minute a piece to try to distill, boil it down to the essence. Go. Okay, this question is to Stuart Taylor. It's the question you invited. In light of your conclusions, why did you and your co-author not call for uh, abolishing race-based admission decisions? Very good question, and I'll be <coughs> quick about it. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Sandy Levinson in passing for a very fair amount of criticism, which I won't respond to. I could, but uh, I don't want to burn too much time. Um, uh, first, uh, there are several reasons. First, if there were a ban on racial preferences entirely, and it were complied with, which is a big if, there would be a drastic plunge in minority admissions at the top several dozen universities, if not under 200. Uh, you know, I mean, you know, Harvard, 9% to 1% or 2%, and, and so in Texas, very, very big plunge. It's a bigger plunge than people realize, because the preferences are bigger than people realize. And there are friends of mine, Roger Clegg's one, terrific uh, critics of affirmative action, who say, well, so, uh, that's the way it would be, but I, 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 I flinch at that. Second, the size of the plunge would be limited because there would be a, elaborate evasions by the universities, which are very determined to keep up their racial numbers any way they can. Uh, the University of California has done that in the wake of Proposition 209, and, and Texas is done that in a way I would call it invasion. It's a circumvention through the 10% plan. Well, the 10% plan in Texas leads to more mismatch problems, which is really where the rubber meets the road for us, than uh, straightforward racial preferences do. You take the kid who was uh, in the nine, top 9% nine of the class in the worst high school in the state uh, gets in. Uh, the kid, kid who was in the 11th, uh, terms in, 11% of the class in the best high school in the class that does not get in, let's say they're both black, well, the, the one who got in is probably gonna have a harder time than the one who didn't. Uh, second, we think small preferences, there's a lot to be said against any kind of racial preferences on moral whatever grounds. Again, our, our cause is protecting the supposed beneficiary. Small preferences do little harm, we think. Uh, they may even do some good if people are within striking distance of their classmates and they can you know, be pulled up by the competition rather than be demoralized by it. Um, I think there's something, the one point the Supreme Court made at Grutter, which I thought was an appalling opinion, uh, that resonates with me a little bit, is integrating our leadership class is a good thing. I think actually the kind of preferences we have may cut in the opposite direction, but I, but, uh, but a, a flat band might cut, cut too far. And last, it would be a very bold use of judicial power. Uh, I wouldn't go so far as to say the Equal Protection Clause has nothing about race. I think it says plenty about race, and there's a gazillion precedents that say it says plenty about race. But I don't think it establishes a colorblind constitution. Uh, nor do any precedents establish a colorblind constitution. The Supreme Court, in, any, in a lot of the cases that Professor Garlia very eloquently denounced, has uh, said race can be considered. Um, to throw all that overboard, it would be a bold use of judicial power, even though I might like it. You put all that together, and I like the idea of the more surgical reforms that we propose, both as something that might be effective and as something that would be, if not 
a modest use of judicial power, it'd be more modest than a ban. 148 characters or less. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think about um, replacing racial preferences with economic-based affirmative <coughs> action? So that way, people, you still give opportunities for people who are uh, underprivileged, but you send a message to society that we're not going to treat you differently just because of which racial box you check off on the form. Our folks in favor of that, but I won't, I won't waste time elaborating on it unless someone else wants to discuss that. There's really not much disagreement that uh, someone who's overcome difficulties uh, should be given a break. It happens, uh, they've overcome difficulties, but they're, not, they're not, likely, not likely to outperform their scores anyway. The problem they see with the uh, using socioeconomic status is because uh, although blacks are disproportionately low uh, status, uh, the number of whites is much larger. And it does not achieve uh, very much the, what they're interested in. You'll, you'll wind up with a lot of poor uh, Asians and whites, and this is all about trying to get, you know, you're just trying to get blacks in there. The, the, Mr. Taylor says, we want openness. We want, well, the thing we want to do is tell these schools that they're going to have to stay exactly what they're doing so we know. Well, that's another way of saying abolition. They can't do that. The whole point of this is the blacks aren't getting in and you want to make it look like they are. So they created hate speech codes to prevent discussing uh, how they got in. So uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's impossible. I may be exhibit A for kind of the poor white kid. You know, I grew up in a little double wide trailer out in the country in a town of 32 people surrounded by cotton fields and cattle and a neuter parent finished high school much less anything beyond. My father died when I was six years old, he was 40. My mom did what a lot of heroic single moms do. She hunkered down and, and she waited tables at the local truck stop along the interstate near where I grew up. And um, she waited tables for about 55 years and finally retired a few years ago. And I did the math the night before I joined the court, I found a website that'll estimate, estimate the number of miles people log in different occupations, you know, letter carrier, really high, waitress really high. And I discovered in my crude math that she had walked in 55 years, roughly from the Earth to the moon, about a quarter million miles. So in Texas terms, put your finger in the corner of the panhandle and trace the border of our state 75 times. And I tell people, you know, and it sounds like a cliche, but, you know, every step that she took brought, you know, me, this grateful son, the first to ever venture beyond small town life and go to college. You know, one step closer to this honor I have of serving 26 million people on the court. And um, I found, we just moved my family recently, I found some old financial aid forms from college in boxes. And I saw her income in a staggering 11,000 a year, 12, $13,000 a year. It just floors me, floors me. I have one thing. Let me say, he's, he's prosperous. My father once bragged, bragged to the family that he made $3,000 that year. 19, 1936, $3,000 was an achievement. How old are you, are you I, I feel that we've made the issue a little bit too simple up here. That we have, Color blindness is kind of a disparate impact, um, and that if we did away with the rules about disparate impact, and we simply went to a color blindness test, we would be okay. Well, I, the problem with the color blindness test, as everyone knows, is that it is extraordinarily hard to prove intent. Um, and if we started out, even with school desegregation, say everyone can go uh, to the nearest school, we know the history of Southern uh, school desegregation, there would be innumerable tricks to avoid real desegregation. So disparate impact um, in the form of uh, requiring certain percentage of black students in particular schools was absolutely essential to sudden school desegregation. Now that doesn't mean we have to continue it forever, but it does mean that we can't simply retreat to the idea that if you don't have an attempt of dis discrimination, that should be end of the story. The salmon shirt, go. Um, staying in the same vein as the previous questioner, I'm curious, Professor Taylor, whether you're concerned that mismatch issues would also come up under socioeconomic-based preferences as they do under race-based preferences. 
Uh, it, it's a risk, but I don't think it's a large risk. And this limits the extent to which I can agree with what uh, Sandy Levinson said. The colleges don't have enough money to provide the financial aid, especially in this day and age, to really go hot wild on socioeconomic preferences. There is a large pool of very well qualified people who could do fine at the University of Texas or at Harvard or whatever, who are now being ignored and more or less shunned by them. Uh, and, uh, and, and therefore, you could admit all of the people they can afford to take through socioeconomic preferences would be pretty well qualified. This would put a lid on the racial preferences to the extent that they could be no larger. Yes, ma'am. Again, you don't want too big a gap. You, you don't do uh, socioeconomically deprived people a favor by putting them in a school for which they're not qualified. That's the essence of what he's saying, and that's true as to all people. We all do better in a school in which we're qualified. Just to clarify, I think that, you know, it's a coincidence. If, if they had infinite money and they could give the same size preferences to poor whites that they now give to rich blacks, it would produce, present exactly the same mismatch problem, but they don't have that much money. Um, Professor Harriet mentioned that there's a lack of courage sometimes when it comes to having conservatives and libertarians opposing some of these measures. So do you the panelists have any suggestions on how we can reframe these complex issues in the public sphere in a way that won't get be branded as either racist or sexist when discussing these issues? I've always found there's safety in numbers. Um, and that is like <laughs> if, 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 more, if more people would speak out in a civil tone, um, I don't think it's that hard. I think the problem is that so many people don't want to speak up. Uh, I don't think it's that difficult to be civil. Um, and to discuss issues in, in, in ways that, that people who disagree with you will understand. You know, you're, you're speaking in good faith. Um, just speak up. I, I add one thing to that. I think it would help a lot if people, if conservatives would say, we have a problem with education of disadvantaged children, and come up with some alternatives, um, and not simply say, well, you know, that's, uh, we shouldn't deal with that through uh, civil rights law, it has to be some kind of alternative presented to make it a credible case. I, on the other hand, I think that there's been a problem with conservatives thinking they have to come up with an alternative and coming up with bad alternatives. So if you're going to do this, come up with a good alternative. <laughs> to deal with. That's really too bad. You know what's worse? Is when we have the funds and still can't deal with it. You know, and that's, this is, comes from this uh, education gap, this, this racial education gap that begins in kindergarten, and then with our public school system, it only increases. And you know, everything is devoted, literally it's cost trillions of dollars are spent on that, and that's what, of course, what is, is the center and cause of all these problems, but we're not clear what to do about it, what the alternative is. We've got to move fast. You've been real patient. Go ahead. I, uh, my question is for Mr. Taylor. What happens when you look at the numbers for minorities who get into elite schools who are a number uh, who have a number of clones in those elite schools who are not minorities? And similarly, what happens for those affirmatively acted upon minorities who decide to go to a school that they are qualified to go to because they receive scholarship money? And how do they compare in performance to uh, schools who are not affirmatively acted upon in those very same schools? Thank you. Not sure I understood the first part of your second question, so come back and do the second part. There's a study that my uh, a very good study that my co-author uh, uh, made a big part of his pitch. When you take law students, black law students, who went to more prestigious and less prestigious schools who are similarly qualified, and there's a database where you can you can do this because of, it's the people who took second choice schools, they got into let's say Penn and they went to Ohio State because of family or money, or whatever. Uh, there's a lot of data that suggests that the ones who went to the less prestigious schools, who have a smaller preference, if you will, uh, do better uh, in grades, better graduation, uh, not necessarily graduation rates, better on the bar exam. Okay, thank you. Let's just do two more if we can. I'm sorry, I just want to be um, mindful of our reception and getting over there. Um, but feel free to catch our panelists after this. I'm sure they'd be happy to entertain the questions. Go, over here. So this is a question about the mismatch, mismatch hypothesis. One of your proposed suggestions was about transparency. 
Um, I, I guess I'm curious, do you think that would be enough? And to ask that in a slightly different question, if you were personally advising someone who had read your book and was choosing between a school that they were not sort of numerically qualified for but had been accepted to either because of racial preferences or athletic preferences or any other sort of preference, would you advise them go to this school knowing that it's going to be a tough slog and you have to work really hard to compete? Or would you advise them no, go to the school that you are sort of more numerically qualified for? Yeah, I, it's a very good question. Um, I think transparency would do a lot of good. I think the way I try and approach the situation you suggest is to say, look at the numbers, look at your numbers, look at the college averages numbers, look at all the data, and you, you decide. You decide whether getting the prestige bump is worth it to you, uh, given the risk you're taking that you might not do so well. And by the way, if the prestige bump is getting you into Harvard, it's probably a stronger case to be made for it than if it's getting you into a, you know, the 20th ranked college in the country. If it were my kid, and she said, that's too complicated, just tell me where to go. I think I'd tell her to go to the, uh, to the place that's a little less prestigious, where, uh, where she could be more confident she'd be competitive. You could make an argument that you should take, choose the Yale, right? The Yale is extremely difficult to get into. You can't believe the median LSAT is the 99th percentile. As hard as it is to get into, it's even harder to plunk out of. <laughs> that, that can't be done. So once you're in, you're going to graduate. And now the question is, do you do better graduating in the bottom of Yale? If, if, if they don't even tell you, they're not going to try, they're not going to try to write and so on. Would you be better off graduating at the bottom of Yale or at the top of the University of Texas? And that, that's a, that could be a real question. But there are very few, as, as Stuart just said, that, that situation arises rarely. If, if the case, question is whether you should go to a, a top 20 school rather than a top 30 school, then that, 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 that trade-off is not there entirely. And the situation is, especially in science and engineering, it's just a clear loss how the, the preference causes them to drop out of those uh, subjects. Yeah, I want to say one thing about your question. Um, as you mentioned athletics, the most important affirmative action program at most universities is, deals with athletics. And you just, you know, might ask yourself, would you advise people to, uh, you know, whether the NCAA insists on calling a student athlete, to choose the school that will offer the best education, you know, by match or not? Now, one of the reasons that sounds like a silly question is that. A, deep, a goodly percentage of the student athletes have no interest in graduating. Um, the, you know, the one and done programs in college basketball. So it would be absurd to say, don't go to Kentucky, um, which by stipulation on this is going to be a you know, harder school than Northern Kentucky. Uh, it'd just be a stupid decision. But that has to do with why people go to school. And we're making certain assumptions that of why people go to school, you know, whether we're talking about you know, any particular individual. But I think it is interesting at least to look at the affirmative action issue through the lens of athletic preferences, uh, which are far, far more important, particularly with small schools, uh, than uh, racial or ethnic preferences. Can I say I actually uh, faced this issue once. Uh, one of my colleagues came to me. Uh, his daughter had gotten into MIT. Um, off the second waiting list, um, and I begged him, you know, don't don't advise her to go to MIT under these circumstances. Please, please, please. I won't I won't identify the other school that she got into, and he was kind of skeptical. But it turned out when he went to his daughter, he he finally sort of got a sense of what I was trying to say. But it didn't matter anyway because she had absolutely no interest in any school where she came off the second waiting list. So she wanted to go to the school uh, that was slightly less high. Uh, and I think as a result, she's got an engineering future ahead of her that looks very bright. One thing I think is an important distinction. Uh, Yale is, is almost impossible to flunk out of. Southern Illinois University, 25% of their black males graduate with six years. That's not at all hard to flunk out of. And I'm reading from an email I got in response to the book from somebody who teaches there. And it's pretty much uniformly true that at the very top of the prestige curve, the 
academic gaps, racial academic gaps, are considerably smaller than they are when you get down to, say, Southern Illinois University. And that's where the damage is most severe. Yes, ma'am. Alexander Harrison from the University of Texas. Um, it seems to me like we have a values clash, at least as Federalists, between market principles of supply and demand and the equality of opportunity that we value in the American dream. As the demand for education has risen, so has the cost. So I'm wondering, as responsible citizens and possibly future politicians, what role both state and federal government should play in trying to reduce the cost of higher education, um, whether by racial quota or social, socioeconomic status? <laughs> My daughter graduated the uh, UT Law School in 1984. Uh, my other daughter graduated Baylor Med, I think, in 1986. And each of those schools set me back about $400 a year. <laughs> and, and it was a burden. I, I didn't turn away any cases. I had to do it. <laughs> but, but the resident tuition at the University of Texas now <coughs> Uh, for resident for tax residents is about thirty-four thousand. For non-residents, about forty-five thousand. Can you even believe those numbers? How did it go from nothing to four thirty, forty thousand? Uh, well, you know, they uh, they decided that the demand for legal education was totally inelastic. It didn't matter how high the price went, people are going to do it. And uh, it turned out the faculty was, to a large extent, in charge of tuition. And the larger tuition meant larger uh, uh, salaries. And law professors no, no longer lead a monastic life. <laughs> How short can you make it? Uh, why not just go? Uh, the original uh, Civil Rights Act like the 14th Amendment, was designed to protect all rights. But in the intervening years, amendments have begun to enumerate rights and courts to disregard rights that are not enumerated. So how do you feel about uh, going into the archives of all of the rights that have been recognized through 800 years of legal history and simply enumerating all of them in amendments to the Civil Rights Act so that uh, we have a full deck. That's what Levin said. You know, it's obviously a fair question. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I think you find a belief in certain unenumerated rights across the spectrum. The problem with unenumerated rights is precisely that we can't point to a text and therefore um, really um, you know, argue with one another about how one tells that they are so fundamentally part of the American experience. My own view is that Justice Scalia's opinion in Heller is absurd as a work of history, but that the outcome is really quite defensible if he'd simply pointed out that by the mid 19th century, there was certainly a very, very strongly established, unenumerated right to have a firearm in terms of self defense. The Second Amendment is a complicated amendment. Uh, we really do have to talk about militias, about uh, the ability to rise up against tyranny and things like that. Um, but he is caught in a program that he insists is originalism and that avoids a much more cogent discussion than he might have given. You know, obviously there are many other examples that, that could be given, but yeah, it does seem to me that the Ninth Amendment says as explicitly as any piece of text can say, that the enumeration of certain rights should not be interpreted as a statement that this is an exclusive set of rights and we haven't written them down and they don't exist at all. The last word, Professor Grodin. I think it's wonderful to rely on the Ninth Amendment, which is 
obviously put in for an entirely different purpose. And the idea that somehow what you're doing here is enforcing the Constitution is just completely wrong. You know, that's about how to interpret the Constitution. Constitutional interpretation has nothing to do with this. You know what? When in the, the Heller case, that's the uh, basic uh, individual right to own case, you have four justices saying the Second Amendment doesn't do it, four justices saying it does. You can't in that case judge join the ones who says it does. But did the four who do, the other four not, not know how to read? Is it a difficulty? And they took different, the, the same four divide on every issue. Is it because they, they can't read the Constitution? No, it's purely ideological. The Constitution has nothing to do with it. <laughs> that if, if, the, if Kennedy had voted with the four uh, uh, liberals, we wouldn't have an individual right to hold on. If he had voted with the four uh, liberals on the uh, uh, corporate speech, then Congress could regulate speech. And the First Amendment would lie there as happy as can be, just <laughs> like that. <now. laughs> Well, it's, got, it's got nothing to do with it. If you want to decide, for example, the gun, the, the gun control, what should the gun control issue be in New York and Chicago? I sure don't know, but I can tell you, I don't know a worse way to decide that is let's study the, fourth, the Second Amendment. Let's see if we can think what's, what happened, what Madison thought about this. Could there be a worse way to decide it? What happened, what Madison thought about it? This whole interpret the Constitution idea is a mistake. On that theory note, we are adjourned.